Good morning, church. We're doing something very exciting today, at least I think it's exciting. Pastor Athena and I are preaching basically the same sermon at the same time. We've worked on a six-week sermon series on the theme of wilderness. So I'll be in here for three weeks, she'll be in there for three weeks, and then we're going to swap for the second three weeks of Lent. And we're going to talk about wilderness, and in particular, these six things, shelter, fire, community, water, food, and direction, all elements that, you, that are needed for survival. That's what we're going to talk about. And today, we're going to talk about shelter. Shelter is a basic human need. In my opinion, I don't think it's really an opinion, all humans deserve shelter. We should start with every human on the planet having adequate shelter. Food, clothing, and shelter are things we teach kindergartners are our basic needs. And the more we study the need for shelter, the more we get convinced that we ought to be giving shelter to every human on the planet. It's kind of bonkers that we don't. And what we're seeing is that in many places, I have a friend who is a, uh, a, a rehab, a drug rehab therapist in the city of Charlotte. And they convinced the city of Charlotte to give them millions of dollars for what they call the Housing First program. And what it says is, before we can treat any addiction of any kind, we must give people housing. Because once we've given them basic things like housing and food and clothing, then we can tackle the bigger issues. It's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you studied that. And so what he would do is go into people's new houses, their new apartments, and say, wow, look at your apartment. Look at this art you put on the wall. Oh, yeah, that's from my granddaughter. Or look at the, you know, uh, I love your house. And it, it gives us a sense of identity and purpose. The times in my life that I've spent working with people experiencing homelessness, the, very, the first few nights when we would open our church as an emergency shelter, you, it was hard to get people to make eye contact with you because they were so used to being treated as subhuman. They're so used to be treated like a problem or an issue or somebody that the p- police yell at to get off a bench or something. And it takes about a week, usually right at a week, When we start remembering people's names and they start being excited to see us, and all of a sudden you see their personhood come back. Shelter is a basic human need. Now what we're going to talk about today is the difference between temporary and permanent shelters. I did some studying this week about the Lumbee and Tuscarora tribes that the native lands that, uh, that our church is built on, this area of North Carolina, has been continuously inhabited for 14,000 years. Did you know that? The state of North Carolina has been continuously inhabited for 14,000 years. And there are many structures around that have lasted thousands of years, but most are gone. Most are gone. Uh, in some part, because they were built from materials that were meant to decompose. A teepee, for instance, is an early tent. It is a temporary shelter. It was meant to be able to travel with it. You see that the sticks are thin enough where you could take this down and you could take the sticks with you. You could bundle them up and put them on the back of a horse, for instance, and uh, take them with you. And the teepee is animal skins. See, this is a very clever, ingenious way to have a temporary shelter. I was at REI yesterday, and boy, they make camping look more fun than it is. (laughs) I was in there just trying to get inspiration for the sermon, and I'm like, man, I really want that machete, you know? That looks cool. Look at these stoves over here. Wow, this thing is a spork and a knife all in one. So many cool things. I can use this straw and drink out of the most poisonous lakes that I can find. I don't know about you, but I don't love sleeping in a tent. We do it 
exactly once a year with you people of Christ the King. And we go to Jordan Lake just in case we want to go home. <laughs> we can get there. I remember my parents dragging us to campgrounds all over the state of Texas. We didn't have a lot of money, and it was a cheap way. And if we were really living high on the hog, we'd stay at a KOA. Anybody? A KOA was the fanciest of all the campgrounds. I remember my parents taking me to Stephen F. Austin State Park, and it rained the entire weekend. And I look back and say, why didn't we go home? I remember there being water in our tent, like an inch of water in our tent. And we didn't have air mattresses in the 1900s. Somebody say amen, okay? That was not the way we were living. We were on the ground. And if there was a rock, there was a rock. You just tried to sleep around it. And uh, I remember on that trip, my dad looking at the back of the package of hot dogs and saying, well, at least they're already cooked. This thing about living in the wilderness is that it's hard. And shelter is the thing that helps us feel like it's manageable. Shelter provides protection. It gives us warmth, right? The animal skins around the teepee. And the the way tents are designed is to sort of to keep some of that warmth in. And it gives us a sense of home, even a temporary one. Even when uh, it's just a tent outside in the wilderness. Have you ever been somewhere that felt completely foreign? And then after a couple days, you're like, oh, finally, I can get back home. Whether that's a hotel room or a tent, our minds conceive of this is where I belong. This is where I rest. This is where I find sanctuary in the wilderness. Well, the problem is that when we don't have shelter, we're exposed. For those of us who volunteer, voluntarily go <laughs> spend time in the wilderness, that exposure can sometimes just be bugs, right? Which are bad enough. I'm only going to last out there as long as the deep woods off lasts, right? Or the citronella candles. But for people experiencing homelessness, or for anyone who's exposed for a long period of time, it is terrifying. Exposed to animals, exposed to nature, the wind and the rain and the cold, exposed to snakes and all kinds of nocturnal Uh, animals and insects, that exposure to the world around you, to other people who might want to do you harm. When I was uh, in my 20s, we used to go down to Mexico and build houses. Uh, I was a youth director in Tempe, Arizona, or Phoenix, Arizona, for five years. And uh, once or twice a year, we would go down into Mexico, into Tijuana, or Rosarito, or Rocky Point, Mexico, and we would build these houses. And I think, I wouldn't, but I think I could still build this house without the manual, right? I've done it enough times that um, this is me up on the roof in the yellow shirt there. We didn't take great pictures back then. It just wasn't a thing. Um, I'm impressed that there are any, and then I'm in the middle of of this one with my my same hat on. We would go down and buy hats, because, you know, that's what you do uh, in Rosarito, Mexico. And uh, I kind of loved it. And we would sleep in tents, and then we would talk to the kids about how we are sleeping in temporary shelters in the desert, in the Mexican desert, so that we can build more permanent shelters for people who are stuck in temporary shelters. And these things were not fancy. It's two rooms It's about 400 square feet, and it has a concrete slab of a floor, no running water, and no plumbing. What we would talk with our youth about at night was how excited the families were who were going to get this. Often young families who are are, uh, a, a future mom and dad where she's pregnant, who are leaving, trying to leave their parents' house and settle into their own place how excited they are for this thing built by high schoolers, not of the greatest construction quality. The outside 
was wrapped in chicken wire, and then we put concrete cement up to make stucco. Not the greatest of structures. But when you're living in the wilderness, this feels permanent. This feels like home. And so it would be really fun to, to work with the family. You know, uh, often some people from the family would come and help too. Uh, and, you know, they'd want to spruce it up a little bit. So we'd lay concrete and then we'd help them lay tile if they had bought tile or something like that. Uh, or put in some drywall or maybe run a tiny bit of electricity or something like that. It's really humbling. It was really humbling to be part of that and to know that much of the world lives uh, in a somewhere between a temporary and a permanent structure. Well, why am I telling you all this? Because in Lent, we talk about the story of the Passover, which we read today. The story of Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days mirrors the story of the Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years. And what we read, what Mike read this morning, is how they left their permanent structures and went out into the wilderness. Think about how hard and terrifying that must be. The writer of Exodus tells us that they were to take a lamb and slaughter it all at dusk, and they were supposed to eat it with their sandals on, with all of their clothes on, ready to go. They're eating in a hurry. This is the last supper of the Israelite people in Egypt. They are leaving tonight. This is the last. And they should take the blood and smear it on the doorpost as they transfer that port, that um, cross that boundary from their shelter into the wilderness. They willingly leave. And they go out into the wilderness where they are exposed for a long time. And did you catch this part? They get to the wilderness and they start talking about how good they had it in slavery. They start talking about how they want to go back because at least there, there was shelter. At least there, there was food. Even though it was awful, being exposed in the wilderness felt uncomfortable and worse. And so they start assembling what we call the Back to Egypt Committee. And they grumble at Moses, saying, this is all your fault. You led us into a new place. You know, here at Christ the King with Pastor Wolfgang's last Sunday, last week, the wilderness sometimes fits that theme of Lent, but it also can fit a church where there are going to be times where we're going to say, let's go back. Let's, let's do it the way we used to do it. Let's, let's, you know, go back to the pre-pandemic. Let's go do the things that, you know, this pastor or, or that time or we did then or back then or we should go back. And we can't. Simply put, we can't. I'm a big fan of this phrase that you're going to hear a lot from me. The past gets a vote, not a veto. I think that's very true in all of our lives. So much we wish we could go back. So much we wish for the safety and security and we trick ourselves that the good old days were always good. And it's not always true. We tell a narrative that's whitewashed, that's, that's devoid of the struggle of those days. We look back at camping and say that was fun, even though we know it wasn't. And then we sign up to do it again. <laughs> it's hard being in the wilderness. And I love how the Israelites finally come to terms with this. They know that they're going to be in the wilderness for a while. They finally settle in. And they build not only dwellings for themselves, but a sanctuary to God. A temporary one called the tabernacle. And in it, they start finding a way to live in this new reality. They start going from survival to thriving ever so slightly. Day after day, they get a little bit better about how to collect the firewood, about how to find the food, about who's got what jobs. They get a little bit better about making temporary shelters that can be moved. They get a little bit better about telling their story. We once were slaves in Egypt, and now we are free. They sing songs 
they start worshiping God. See, that's the thing that they couldn't do back in Egypt, was worship God. When they were in Egypt, they had no days off. And now they start establishing for themselves a Sabbath, a holy day of rest and prayer. So, friends, what I want you to know about shelter is that time in the wilderness is temporary. It won't always be like this. There is hope on the other side of the river, which is what we're going to talk about, how the river represents change and into the promised land. But here in the wilderness, let's find ways to thrive. Here in the season of Lent, let's dig deep into who we are so that we can be transformed by our lives and let the wilderness transform us. The wilderness is temporary, but let's make the most of it. Amen.